Brought to you by Business Fights Poverty. Hello and welcome to Business Fights Poverty's Social Impact Pioneers podcast series. I am Katie Heisen, Director of Thought Leadership. These interviews with social impact pioneers provide you with insights, different perspectives, advice and maybe a little inspiration, giving you first-hand understanding of how businesses and others are tackling some of the world's biggest social challenges so that you can learn from those who have been there before, helping you in your decision-making and action-taking. If you had money to invest, would it matter to you if it was a man or woman's company that you were investing in? Apparently it does to pretty much all of us, whether we notice it or not. My social impact pioneers today are determined to change that. They are driving data collation, research and programs to support investors and to support entrepreneurs. These two social impact pioneers are dedicating their work to figuring out how to better support female entrepreneurs, how to unlock the social and economic power of 50% of our global powerhouses, women. Meet Heather Matranga and Sanjukta. Mitra. Heather is the Vice President and Managing Director of Impact Investments at Village Capital. Village Capital is the largest organisation in the world supporting impact-driven seed stage startups. Heather leads the organisation's strategy for deploying capital into these early stage impact-creating businesses. In her role, she has led research into strategies to mitigate bias in the investment process with a particular emphasis on the gender financing gap. We're going to hear more about that and this research shortly. Heather, based in the US in Washington, has a legal background. Prior to joining the team, Heather worked as an attorney advisor for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, providing legal support to help individuals, state and local governments recover from disasters. While Sanjukta Mitra is the liabilities product head, business banking in India at Standard Chartered Bank. Sanjukta leads the global SC Win program, who are on a mission to partner with and empower women entrepreneurs through banking and beyond across the world. She is based at Mumbai, India, and has been in banking for over 12 years, focusing on financial product development, always with a passion for helping women succeed. So Sanjukta, and Heather, welcome. Great to have you here today. Great to be here. Great to be here. Oh, thank you so much for giving your time to talk to us. So Sanjita and Heather, I wanted to start our conversation today and really set the scene. Why do we need to be rethinking how we finance female entrepreneurs? Sanjita, would you mind going first? Sure, Katie. So firstly, it's great to be here sharing my thoughts on women entrepreneurship, a subject I'm very passionate about. So, you know, overall, there was a lot of research that we had done with IFC, and I'm going to start off by sharing some stats. So, overall, of the global WSME customer base that exists, 71% is in Asia. And just sharing a number to that, it is approximately 38 million women-owned MSMEs that are in Asia. And of the overall financing gap that exists of approximately 1.5 trillion, 1.25 trillion financing gap exists for WSMEs in Asia. Now, I'll just come to, you know, basis research that we've done, customers that we've spoken to. We figured that the reason for this disparity is largely because women in general have less access to traditional banking services and have unmet credit needs, owing to which they normally turn to informal markets for funding instead of coming to a bank. Wow, they are some massive, massive statistics there. Heather, what about yourself? I mean, how do you how do you see this in terms of needing potentially to reframe how we think about financing female entrepreneurs? Is is there something we need to specifically do differently for female entrepreneurs in comparison to their male counterparts? Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on this podcast. I'm really excited to talk about the work that we do. I'm an honor to be here. To answer your question, the way that Village Capital, we really think about this is there are these Uh, really, really challenging problems that we're facing in the world, problems around climate change, problems around um, economic disparity. And to solve those problems, we really need a diversity of perspective and a diversity of ideas. 
However, as Sanjukta just really outlined, the capital markets are leaving so many entrepreneurs on the sideline. In addition to some of the stats that she mentioned, when we look at um, just that how capital is distributed to between male and female entrepreneurs, we see that 85% of venture capital and venture capital is the type of capital that is often sought after for scalable businesses. 85% has gone entirely to men, entirely to uh, founding teams led by men. And less than 2% goes to founding teams entirely led by women. And when you and the the disparity continues to exist, even when there's only one female on the founding team, we see that only about 12% of venture capital is going, um, are going to those mixed gender founding teams. When we're leaving 50% of the world's population on the sidelines, we're leaving really, really critical ideas and innovation that are necessary to solve these critical problems. Um, and to indre- address this, we need to rethink how we're distributing capital. We need to rethink how we're supporting entrepreneurs. We can't just think about what, if we really want to change what gets funded, we need to change who gets funded, which means changing how they get funded. So Heather, I want to stick with you. You're part of Village Capital, who are partnering with Standard Chartered Bank. Um, Can you share with us a bit about what Village Capital does normally? What's your day job? Um, But also what you guys are doing perhaps a bit differently with Standard Chartered? Yes, definitely. So Just to sort of give you an overview of our work at Village Capital, we're really focused on unlocking capital, both financial and social capital for impact creating startups globally. We have a specific focus on companies solving problems in economic opportunity and sustainability. And we have an emphasis on founders with lived experience because we really believe those founders are the ones best suited to solve the problems. Therefore, to really support founders with lived experience, um, those are often the founders that are left on the on the sidelines within the capital markets, um, including female entrepreneurs. So to really support those founders, we have to rethink and reinvent the the system of support. And to reinvent that system, Village Capital, we engage in the system in really three ways. First, we work directly with entrepreneurs. We have been around since two thousand nine, running what we call investment readiness programs, but essentially, programs that are meant to support, directly support entrepreneurs with their ability to attract investment capital and access resources, access networks, access mentors. We've worked with about 1,400 uh, entrepreneurs globally across 150 or so programs. In addition to working directly with entrepreneurs, we work with other what we call entrepreneur support organizations or commonly known as accelerators. So we focus on supporting locally led place-based accelerators to help build their capacity to support entrepreneurs directly. And then finally, we work directly with investors. We have a strategy that we call um, assets under influence, where we have a focus on influencing how capital is distributed and who is really able to access that type of capital. By working with investors, we develop different tools and strategies for investors to deploy capital into impact creating startups. Through this work, we've made about 150 direct investments globally, and we leverage really innovative strategies to support these investors and to support startups through these investments, which I'm happy to talk more about. Our partnership with Standard Charter, we're really, really excited about because it allows us to continue our our support of early stage startups to focus on supporting these impactful and innovative and quality women-led startups and uh, to do so by piloting and testing new diff- new strategies. So we are supporting Standard Chartered specifically on their women in tech program. Um, Standard Chartered has been running a women in tech program globally, which is focused on supporting entrepreneurs lifting their participation in the formal banking and commercial financing sector. They have run programs in Bahrain, Ghana, Kenya, Korea, Nigeria, Pakistan, United Arab Emirates, the United States, and Zambia. And they're kicking off new programs this year in Malaysia, South Africa, Singapore, and Taiwan. And our our engagement with Standard Charter really we're able to leverage the three ways we engage in the ecosystem. We're able to provide some guidance and expertise on the best strategies to support those early stage 
companies that are coming through their programs and help support the the local implementing partners. In addition, what we're really, really excited about is we are launching a pilot financing facility that will invest in alumni, so graduates of that Women in Tech program. The focus of the, of the financing facility is to provide that critical early stage catalytic capital to select alumni companies. It's a pilot financing facility, so we're aiming to invest in between 10 to 15 alumni companies with this critical uh, catalytic capital and help them develop scalable and sustainable business models. Catalytic capital is sort of a buzzword in this space, but for us, what we really mean is the capital that can de-risk the company to help crowd in additional sources of funding. So that early stage, very risk tolerant, um, highly flexible capital that will allow the entrepreneurs to get to a stage and send such a market signal that other investors can come in. We are looking for a return on these investments, but we're we're making the investments with this very highly risk flexible mindset to allow these companies to grow where the, we just see these capital continuing capital gaps in the ecosystem. Um, previously, I had mentioned that that 2% stat that only 2%, like 2% of venture capital goes to female led female founded uh, companies. That has not changed over the past decade, despite numerous commitments uh, to really address this issue. There's been many, many government initiatives uh, globally, the governments throughout the world. There's been a lot of heightened focus on this, which is definitely what we need. But intention is not the only thing that's going to get us there. We really need to change the way that we're supporting entrepreneurs in general and change the way that we're supporting female entrepreneurs. And we're excited to test some of those strategies with this with this pilot financing initiative. Oh, it's so exciting. It's super exciting. And the number of times, Heather, I, I'm very privileged and honoured to be allowed to talk to and, and hear from uh, social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs around the world. And the number of times they said, you know, it's just that first person who takes a bit of a risk on me and my company, my idea, that that's, that's all I needed. And so to have a facility that's specifically to help people with that, you know, as you say, kind of really flexible, the whole point of it is to crowd in other funding. It's just, it makes a huge amount of success. If you don't mind, I'm going to put some links uh, to some of that work into the chat um, uh, words that sit alongside this podcast. So if you're interested and you're listening to this, um, you can find out more and, and make sure that you can kind of potentially be part of it even, um, or indeed learn from from this work. Sandra, I wanted to bring you in um, now. So where Heather's sort of talking about the innovative new finance models, how does what Heather and Village Capital have been learning feed into the work that you're doing with Standard Chartered? I know that you're particularly been working on what's called SC Win, so hopefully you might debug that. What does that mean? Um, but also, what are the challenges that you're seeing to women entrepreneurs at the sort of more commercial level? And how are you looking at that in terms of scaling and growing companies? Sanjita? Thanks, Katie. So, uh, you know, exactly, uh, Heather was mentioning about the lifting participation stand of Standard Charter that we have, exactly in line with the lifting participation, where SCB is standing for equitable access of financial support for women and small businesses, was the inception point of SC Win. So, SC Win is Standard Chartered Women's International Network. So, you know, we this program was brought about thinking in mind that we wanted to provide a sort of a proposition which will help accelerate a quality financial services to women across our footprint markets. We want to also purposely connect these WSMEs to international markets, markets where we are present and otherwise, and also build partnerships to expand the reach and scale of financial services. So that was the reason or the inception point for SC Win, And the way we have sort of branded it is, you know, scale, connect and belong. So scale is typically to help the WSMEs have access to capital and grow their business. Connect is largely to build that global network for better opportunities. And belong is eventually to have the WSMEs be part of this community of like-minded entrepreneurs. So that's pretty much what the offering is in general. And with this, what we're trying to do with this particular network, Women's International Network, in across our footprint markets, we want to bring the full power of our global franchise to the WSME customers. Now, you spoke about the challenges that WSMEs typically face. So we've spoken, we've seen, and as Heather also mentioned, the large capital, the financing need that exists. 
So along with the financing need, there is also a lot of beyond banking proposition that a women SME would be requiring. And through SE Win, we are able to provide curated skill building opportunities for WSMEs to interact with industry mentors and have a cross-border network of WSME leaders that uh, a woman entrepreneur would feel included in. So, you know, with this, uh, we started this initiative uh, sometime in the beginning of last year. And, you know, we had to put in our resources. And eventually in India, we went live in the month of November 2022 with the proposition in India. And in Kenya, we've gone live in March of 23. And we plan to roll this across Malaysia, Hong Kong and Singapore through the course of the year. It's that piece where you guys start talking about the different territories and regions that you're working in. It's just that ability to scale and to learn across borders, as you as you were just saying, Sanjay, to even just to help the the women who are leading those small and medium sized enterprises to learn from each other. It's just it's really special and and doesn't happen very often. Um, Heather, I wanted to bring you back in um, at this point. So we've therefore we've we've got some programs now and s- support for businesses at different levels and women entrepreneurs at different levels. But I wonder whether you could share actually a bit of a perhaps a story like is there a is there a profile of a female entrepreneur who you supported through perhaps the women in tech program and and how that journey sort of potentially brings to life what it could be like for a female entrepreneur so you know what's your sales pitch if you were a female entrepreneur potentially listening to this what what would be the story that they or the journey that they might expect to go on heather uh yeah that's a great question So just to kind of give you a sense of what the overall alumni pool looks like, um, to start us off there, the Standard Chartered has supported around 300 companies that have come um, through the program over over the time that they have supported this program. And we have identified about 50%. About 50% have actually applied for this innovative financing um, vehicle, which is incredible. Of those 50%, they really range um, from in terms of sectors, in, t- in terms of types of companies, so growth profiles, market size, strategies, they range from everything from you know financial inclusion companies to companies addressing challenges in agriculture to those that are t- like cutting coming up with really really innovative ideas around carbon capture and addressing climate change to uh, financing for climate initiatives to healthcare. Uh, So we're really excited to see this broad array of companies uh, with such rich innovation um, and ability to solve some really critical problems. In addition, each of the many of the companies have different growth profiles. So when we're talking about a small and medium enterprise or what I often refer to as a startup, that that can mean a, a variety of things to a variety of different types of investors or support organizations. I like to refer to a resource that really outlines the different growth profiles. So we have everything from dynamic enterprises, which is a type of business that is really more of a traditional business operating in core sectors that has like so, sort of a sustainable growth profile, not like not a super large scalable business, but one that really can be self-sustaining to livelihood sustaining businesses, which we often refer to as main street businesses or those that are really the smaller micro enterprises that maybe are better suited to microfinance or they could be sole proprietorships with one one person on the team or or just really small, like only a a handful of, of team members to niche ventures and high growth ventures, which high growth ventures are often what you hear about those like tech, tech enabled, um, businesses that can really scale to multiple markets um, and really may be better suited for risk, more risk capital. And niche ventures are kind of somewhere in the middle where they they might have an innovative product, but they have like they're tailored to like a particular cu- customer segment or market. And we really see a wide array of companies in in the alumni pool that are within these growth profiles. Which means we really have to think about what types of financing structures are best suited to meet the capital needs of these companies. And just to kind of give you a sense, from the the alumni pool that we've seen and the shortlisted companies, we see that there's millions of dollars that they're requesting, like in aggregate, 
And the average amount that of the capital gap, depending really on the growth profile, is about $650,000. So there's a, certainly a need out there and a critical gap in financing these businesses. And then we, we're still at the stage of evaluating, so getting to know the alumni that have applied for this facility and evaluating which ones are best suited for this just initial pilot, which we are testing a few different strategies. But to give you an example of one that we're speaking with and sort of the, the journey that they've gone on, uh, it's a company called uh, Farmio. And this company is based in, in Ghana. And what they do is they're really focused on helping smallholder and commercial farms build affordable greenhouses, access markets and technical assistance and increase yield. So if you think about some of the challenges that fa- smallholder farmers are facing, it's a really fragmented system that it, agriculture system that's relying on imports and they have access, very limited access to technical assistance, to financing, to infrastructure to help build a profitable business. Um, and really create economic mobility for the smallholder farmers in West Africa. Who we're supporting is this incredible female entrepreneur. She has a background in computer science, but really, and really has close connection to the agriculture industry through her family, really wanting to support founders with lived experience. She is really embodies that. She understands the challenges that smallholder farmers are facing. She has like critical technical st- skills to develop a, a tech and tech-enabled solutions to help address, address those problems, and then the passion and drive to do so. So she launched this business, Farmio, which is really, really focused on addressing some of these challenges that smallholder farmers are facing and providing them access to the resources it inputs and new technologies like uh, greenhouses or new strategies, farming strategies to help them create more economic mobility. And her business, the, the, the way that the business is structured, really, as I sort of outlined those different growth profiles, hers is much more of a niche enterprise, I would say. Um, it's not necessarily, the at least right now, uh, necessarily a high growth tech company like Uber, um, if you think about like high growth ventures that, that can scale to multiple markets very quickly. But it is a tech-enabled uh, solution that can capture the market that she's currently operating in. Um, and so as we're thinking about what source of capital uh, we can provide her to really, again, focus on giving her and her business that catalytic early stage risk capital that she's seeking, we're, we're really evaluating different financing structures, which is what this facility is, is all about. It's really focused on what types of companies can we support with the capital to address capital gaps and catalyze more funding in? And what types of investment structures makes most sense for these companies? So as an example, oftentimes when we're talking about financing companies, the two um, most common forms of financing that come to mind are venture capital, which is really refers to equity instruments where you're actually buying you know, shares in a company. And those are best suited for really high growth tech enabled ventures, or we're talking about debt and debt tends to be more suitable for like businesses that have, that are already de-risked, not super early stage, really, really risky businesses. So we, we think a lot about different types of, different types of investment structures that can still support businesses that need risk capital. Um, so something we're exploring here, for example, is a, a financing structure, redeemable equity, where you're essentially are still buying shares in the company, but the 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 founder can buy it back over time, which allows the investor to see a return on their investment. Um, and also like really importantly, allows the founder to retain ownership of their business rather than dilute their ownership. So that's just an, an example of the type of profile of company we're really excited about. Um, how we're really thinking about not only what we're supporting and who we're supporting, but how we're supporting them and sort of the different strategies that are coming into play. Oh, it's so thoughtful. I mean, when you go into that detail, Heather, you can just, you can see somebody on that journey and a massive good luck to the team behind Farmio as well. Um, I wanted to bring both of you in now, um, Secretary, to perhaps I'll turn to you first. We've had um, previous conversations with two of your, of two future makers, Audrey and Naomi both of whom had set up their own businesses and had been on a journey with 
Standard Chartered and, and part of the Future Makers Network. And both of them, what really struck me about both of the, the amazingness that they are is how self-starting they were, how brave, how much they went out and learned it themselves. But that's not a given. I mean, I, I don't know very many people who are that driven. And I was wondering whether from your experience, but also the work that you're doing, how do you help women step into that, step into that space to be able to see others who've been there before in front of them, to meet people who have overcome some of the challenges that they are facing? Is, is that part of yours kind of thinking? Because Sandra, you already talked about kind of networking beyond borders. Can you share a bit more about what that might feel like and look like? That's a very relevant and apt question, Katie. And, uh, you know, so I want to bring in and uh, talk about SC Win, where apart from the financing uh, piece that we are trying to address, we are also looking at the Beyond Banking proposition, where we support WSMEs with networking, coaching and mentorship. And in fact, in the markets where we've gone live, as I mentioned, in India in November of last year and Kenya, what we've done is we've partnered with local organizations to be able to address the needs of WSMEs specific to the market. So now I'll talk about India as an example. We've partnered with Global Linker. So Global Linker is a fintech service provider. And with them, we co-created a white label platform of SC Global Linker, which basically helps to digitize and connect small businesses to be able to participate in community building, to be able to conduct commerce for their own, for women entrepreneurs' own skilling requirement, as well as have access to business offers. So typically, the global linker platform that I'm talking of is can be seen more like a LinkedIn for SMEs, wherein you know entrepreneurs will be able to connect with each other, and also they get relevant leads of buyers, suppliers, because it's an AI-powered platform. The specific leads that they get for buyers, suppliers will help them grow their business. They're also able to create a website of their own on the global linker platform and publish it in the internet. So a lot of traditional businesses who do not have an online presence can have the product catalog listed on the website and actually initiate business through this digital channel. So that's what we're trying to do to be able to provide beyond banking services for WSMEs in India. So now this I spoke of India. Now coming to Kenya, what we've done is we've partnered with an organization called Kenya Private Sector Association. That's uh, acronym is KEPSA. And what we're doing with them is we are, you know, we, along with KEPSA, we are forming a business networking forum where we are going to be inviting our customers who are women entrepreneurs to participate in the various sessions that KEPSA organizes by which a female entrepreneur will be able to network with another. There, there are some bespoke training packages which are available, which an SC Win client in Kenya can avail of. So now this is largely centered around networking. Now, what is also important is to be able to, for women entrepreneurs to be able to continuously upskill themselves. So what we as a bank have done this globally is we've partnered with MasterCard and MasterCard has their own content or called um, uh, MasterCard's Entrepreneur Odyssey, part of the MasterCard Academy. And under this, there is a playbook which is available, which is nothing but a set of videos and articles from Ivy League professors where a women entrepreneur could go and seek guidance on how to you know, launch a business, how to uh, design the specifics around it, how will they manage as well as grow the business. So this way through SC Win, before the beyond banking requirements, we're providing a holistic sort of a, a proposition to be able to cater to such needs. Back to you, Katie. Oh, thank you for sharing all that. And again, I'm going to come and get all of those links from you, Sanjata, and I'm going to put them in the words that sit alongside because I have a suspicion that uh, it might've got a few people uh, interested. Um, Heather, I wanted to turn to you now because firstly about, you know, beyond the finance piece for the sort of women entrepreneurs, how, how can they step into that? But also, I know that you've done some work around actually how do you unlock the investor community to, to, to refocus on, on female entrepreneurs. And I was wondering whether you could speak a bit to that for us. Yes, absolutely. So as we've outlined, we, we continue to see this really persistent, what we call gender financing gap, this disparity in how capital is allocated. And there have been a lot of initiatives around really supporting female entrepreneurs and you know, direct interventions to help them attract capital, including the work that Village Capital has done, the work that Women in Tech is doing, just amazing work in that area. But there has been less work on really focusing what can investors be doing differently 
And to be quite honest, if we really want to address this gender financing gap, we really have to go to where the capital sits. Like we really have to start addressing um, some of the systemic barriers and challenges that investors and capital allocators are putting in place. So to do that, we engaged in more than two years of research, really rigorous research in partnership with the International Finance Corporation, the Women's Entrepreneurship Finance Initiative, the World Bank Gender Innovation Lab, and researchers from Boston University and the University of Glasgow to conduct really data-driven experimental research to identify specific strategies that investors could leverage and incorporate into their investment process to help overcome um, some of the disparities that we're seeing and how investors are evaluating uh, women-led startups. There's a lot of baseline studies that really go into demonstrate that when investors are looking at a male-led company versus a female-led company, they are inv- evaluating those companies differently. And the, the outcome of that disparity is, is this gender fi- this continuing gender financing gap. And so we really wanted to focus much more on what can investors do differently and ideally strategies that are seamless for them to, to implement. They're very busy. They see lots of companies, um, oftentimes very well-intentioned. However, they are their systems and the processes that they're using do have a deficit. And this deficit is leading to disparity in how capital is allocated. We recently launched a toolkit called Smarter Systems that outlines the strategies that we tested. And after two years of research testing these strategies, we found that when investors leveraged these strategies, there was a 5x increase in how women-led startups were evaluated. So the improvement in evaluation scores for female-founded companies increased by five times, which is incredible and statistically significant amount of improvement. And the interesting thing about these strategies is we never once asked the investors to think about gender. And in fact, they didn't even know that gender lens investing was the objective or um, investing more equitably was necessarily the objective of implementing these strategies. The three strategies can be broken down really into uh, ways to make the investment due diligence process. And the due diligence process is when investors have already have already identified companies and they're really starting to evaluate whether or not those companies are a fit for their capital. To make that that process more data-driven, more comprehensive, and more consistent. When we say data-driven, what we're talking about here is strategies to allow the investor to be more objective when evaluating the founding team. A key component of evaluating companies when, when you're an investor is really understanding the founding team and their potential to execute on their vision, the potential to grow that company. And that potential is just very, very subjective and very, very subject to disparity in in evaluation and inconsistency inconsistency in evaluation. And we've specifically outlined some strategies that investors can use to make that more objective and make that more data-driven, really focusing on evaluating, asking questions that evaluate how the founder thinks about their business and how they've pivoted. So for example, asking what hypotheses, what hypothesis testing or market research have you done to better demonstrate your path to growth? Or how have you pivoted the business to address a particular risk that you see rather than solely evaluating the founder on some interactions you may see or or the resume or what oftentimes they evaluate on unconsciously the gender of the founding team. The second strategy is really to be comprehensive. And this is focused on evaluating when investors are looking at businesses or evaluating both the growth potential of the v- business as well as the risk of that business. And there's been plenty of studies that show that investors will really focus on growth for male-led startups and really focus on risk for female-led startups, which is to the detriment of that female company. If you're only thinking about the downside, then you only see the potential for loss rather than the potential for return or really the possibilities of that company. And so this strategy really focuses on helping investors to make sure they're evaluating both growth and risk comprehensively across all startups and not over over optimizing for one or the other. Um, And then finally, consistently. And this 
this uh, uh, strategy is about ensuring that investors have clear criteria and even weighted criteria and how they're evaluating companies. What do they care about the most? Do they care most about that the core innovation or product or intellectual property of the business? Do they care about the market of the business? Do they care most about the value proposition and the overall problem that the company is trying to solve? This will be different for every investor, but the goal here is to have investors just outline objectively what that criteria is and then use it consistently in evaluating all companies. That is super interesting. Okay, guys, we will go and read this. I'm going to go and get hold of it right away. Heather, you're going to send this to me. I'm going to pass it on to everybody. That is properly interesting stuff. And, and thank you very much for sharing it. Sanjuta, I, was, I wanted to bring you in here because clearly um, Heather's been talking quite a lot in terms of the investor system, the ecosystem, and how do we unlock that potential there? From the work that you're doing and what you're seeing, I mean, how can we as a broader ecosystem also lean into better help and support female entrepreneurs? What's missing? What are the challenges that we still need to address? How can we rebalance that investment data for female entrepreneurs, but also, you know, just to help them succeed and and, and prosper? Sanjata? Yes, Katie. So, so Katie, I'm not able to speak on behalf of other organizations, but we here at Standard Chartered have tried to address the pain points of WSMEs. As for the financing gap that I was talking of, under the scale pillar of uh, SC Win, we are basically supporting the WSMEs to ease out their repayment burden. Uh, you know, so this kind of helps them. So typically for a four-year tenor loan, if you're giving a principal moratorium for the first six to 12 months, depending on whatever is suitable as per the market, you know, that, that helps to ease the repayment burden for a WSME. Likewise, we're also providing a flexible product wherein a woman entrepreneur could take an OD facility instead of a term loan. So because it helps them to, you know, give the freedom to pay as you go kind of a product instead of a fixed EMI product. So all of this we're talking in terms of not providing any collateral. On the unsecured lending, there are various tweaks that we've provided to be able to ease the financing uh, sort of need that women entrepreneurs have. So that aside, on access to networking channels, we've partnered with Global Linker, as I mentioned, in India, as well as Kepsa in Kenya to be able to address uh, beyond banking proposition. And overall, we are trying to create this community of like-minded entrepreneurs. And the bank is providing dedicated RMs for transaction advisory and overall access to our global banking network across markets in Asia, Middle East, and Africa for cross-border facilitation of business. So that's what we as Standard Chartered are doing to be able to address the challenge that women entrepreneurs face. Oh, amazing. And um, for anybody listening and you want to be in, in part of this, whether you're an organization who wants to lean in and help female entrepreneurs, or indeed you want to get and take advantage uh, in the best possible way of uh, some of these programs, some of these the networking opportunities, et cetera, I will, again, I'll make sure that um, I put links to these into the words that sit alongside it. We're closing up this conversation now. I feel like we've scratched the surface here, but at the same time, just sort of, you know, prize open that box of what does it really take to, to unlock the potential of female entrepreneurs and, and really help those businesses scale or become more sustainable. I want to just try and summarize what we've talked about. I want to challenge you both. What would be your one action or, or takeaway that you want to make sure, you know, drill it home for anybody who's listening? To this conversation today. Um, Sangjota, would you mind going first? What would be your one call to action or your takeaway? Yeah, so Katie, I feel women entrepreneurs should pursue their dream of building successful businesses and realize that, you know, in today's date, there is an evolved ecosystem to kind of support their aspiration. This is pretty much in line with what Heather as well mentioned, right? So the fact that they should be reassured that there is this whole community that is uh, there to support them in their aspiration. Another definite call to action I feel for WSMEs would to be for them to ask for help to be able to solve any impediment in their business growth plans. This could be a banking solution that they want to address for their financing need, or it could be access to networks, mentors, and uh, seek coaching capability. And lastly, I feel, uh, Katie, in a digitally connected world, it is important to leverage technology-driven solutions for running business operations, and one should constantly upskill themselves through courses, sessions, which are widely available, uh, you know, through women entrepreneurship chapters in different geographies. So we've done our part trying to bring together a proposition for women entrepreneurs. But I feel there's a lot in the market that can be availed of. And we as a community are there to sort of support 
and see this community thriving. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Sanjita. And Heather, over to you to close us out. Yeah, that was such great tactical advice for uh, women entrepreneurs, and I appreciate it so much. And my takeaway is really going to be for the, the investors, the capital allocators, the ecosystem enablers in the audience. Building on Albert Einstein's quote, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we create them. I'd push us to really just push beyond and think beyond the status quo and how we're financing and supporting women entrepreneurs. Um, Clearly, what we've been doing has not been working and we're not seeing the type of solutions we really need to scale and to grow. And we're not seeing the, the capital flow to really incredible female entrepreneurs the way that we need to. So we, my advice, my, my one takeaway is to reevaluate how you're supporting and how you're engaging in the system and question whether or not there are changes that you can make that um, just because it's some, wh- the way we've always done it doesn't mean that's the way we should continue to do it. And in fact, if it's the way we've always done it, it probably needs some rethinking and redesigning. Well, on that challenge to us all, uh, Sanjuta and Heather, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing, well, quite frankly, steeps of wisdom, insight, but also loads of opportunity. So uh, a massive, massive thank you to you both. Thank you for thank having you. me. And if you like what you've heard today, please do rate and subscribe to us. I would also love to hear your feedback. So please do drop me a line at any time. I'm Katie at businessfightspoverty.org. Many thanks. Thanks.